options, in this screen, I am showing the AMP for Endpoints console. Within AMP for Endpoints, you can configure block and allow list for application control under outbreak control, and then selecting application control and block applications or allow applications. Or you can configure also IP block and allow list, again, based on network IP addresses and network ranges. Now, a blocked application list is composed of files that you do not want to allow users to execute, but you do not want to quarantine. You may actually want to use these for files that you're not sure that they're malware or unauthorized applications, or you may want to use this for stopping applications with vulnerabilities from executing until a patch has been released. Now, allow application uh, list, so in, in this case, uh, this other uh, selection here, are basically for files that you never want to convict. Uh, some examples are custom applications that potentially detected by some generic engine or by a standard image that you want to use through the company, of course, and not block them. You can also perform this type of blocks or allow list using IP blocks, right? Uh, basically using IP addresses, right? And in, in this case, instead of an from an application level uh, identification, now you are defining individual IP addresses or network addresses or CIDR blocks or a combination of IP addresses and ports. So again, these are different examples on how you can perform application and network-based allow and block lists. It's typically a VM or you know some type of system that you can use for analyzing whether a file might be malicious. So in other words, if a file can be a piece of malware or even if a PDF, for example, doesn't have to be an executable if a PDF is malicious or it has a backdoor and so on. Now, Cisco acquired a company called ThreadGrid several years ago, and they provided a very robust sandboxing technology, and that's what I'm showing in the screen right now. Now, ThreadGrid has been integrated with many different Cisco solutions and allows you to send a file either to the cloud and in most cases, it's actually automatic, even without the user knowing, right? For example, an email security appliance may send a file to the ThreadGrid cloud to verify if indeed it's a malicious file or not. Or you can, of course, you know, upload one manually as well. Now, in this case, what you're seeing in the screen is a dashboard of a demonstration where there are several files that have been sent to the cloud, to ThreadGrid, to be analyzed, right? And one of the cool things about this is actually, if you click on any of the files, it provides you a threat score and it gives you all the different details about the file and what potentially done after the file was actually executed, right? For instance, the TCP IP streams, or in other words, if the, the system was trying to communicate out potentially to a malware command and control system and so on, and it also gives you a lot of very detailed information about what were the domains that they were talking, the processes that were uh, affected in the system, you know, any type of other artifacts uh, that were changed in the system, the disk utilization, whether other files were invoked, other executables were also invoked, any registry keys potentially uh, were modified, as you see here, and uh, any you know, potentially created keys. And in this case, of course, this was something that uh, affected the system, executed several files, ex executed several executables <laughs> for uh, Windows, and one is specifically Acro RD32.exe. And you see the different registry keys that were modified, as well as a different uh, one that was actually deleted, right? Several detailed information about the different file activity in the system and you see acro rd32 again you know all over here and the other cool thing is that if you click on this uh, little icon the runtime video it shows you a video of what happened in the system in some cases actually these videos may not show something because it goes too fast in the screen right but in many cases actually you see that you know right now there's a pdf that is being launched and then you know a lot of different things actually happen behind the scenes, right? So if you go over, 
to the dashboard. Again, you also see a summary of all the files, all the different uh, convictions. So in other words, all the files that were actually blocked and um, tons and tons of different statistics. Now for the core exam, you do not need to know how to configure and troubleshoot this. For some of the uh, concentration exams, you do need to know how to configure, troubleshoot and integrate you know, these type of uh, scenarios and these type of solutions with things like firepower threat defense or the content uh, security appliances like the email security appliance or WSA and so on. So, uh, so again, for the core exam, you only need to know the high level concepts of, you know, what is a, a sandbox? How does it use? What are the benefits that it provides? And then for the concentration exams, you definitely have to have some hands on experience with these technologies. need to get familiar with when doing Windows Forensics is how applications, the operating system, and processes work. So let's first run through some of the technical definitions of processes and threats. Uh, when you look at an application and, you know, how is they're actually built from, uh, you will actually find one or more processes. A process is a program that the system is actually running at a specific time or at all times. Each process provides the required resources to execute a program, and also a process is made up of one or more threats, which are the basic unit an operating system will assign resources to. A threat can be executed during any part of the application runtime, including being executed by another threat. Each process starts with a single threat, known as a primary threat, and then uh, they can also create additional threats from you know it's those uh, threats as well, right? So in a hierarchical way. For example, you know, the calculator application could run multiple processes when the user enters numbers to be computed, such as the process to compute the math, as well as the process to display the answer, right? So, you know, regarding threats, uh, think about threats as each number being called while the app, a process is actually doing the computation that will be displayed by that, you know, application, in this case, the calculator. So here I'm actually showing the, the application, um, you know, the calculator application in Windows and how it's actually shown in as a running process in the Windows Task Manager, right? So process can be grouped together and managed as a unit, and this is actually called a job object and can be used to control attributes of the processes they're associated with. Grouping processes together simplifies impacting a group of processes since any operation performing a specific job object will impact all associated processes. A threat pool is a group of worker threats that efficiently execute asynchronous calls back for the application, right? So this is done to reduce the number of application threats and to manage the work threats, right? Or the worker threats. A fiber is a unit of execution that is manually scheduled by an application. So that's another concept um, called a fiber. So now that we actually have covered how applications function, let's look at where they are installed and how they are run, right? So computer memory is a physical device or a physical hardware capable of storing information in a temporary way or a permanent state, right? So memory can be volatile or non-volatile. Volatile memory is a memory that, you know, loses its content when the computer or hardware storage device loses power, right? Or is rebooted. Now, RAM is an example of a volatile memory, you know, since uh, you will never hear people say that they actually will save something to RAM, meaning that is, you know, designed for applications performance and to actually execute programs and to help the CPU execute those programs, right? So, so you may be thinking that there's not a lot of value for the data stored in RAM. However, from a digital forensics viewpoint, the list that I'm actually showing here includes data that could be obtained by investigating the RAM and it can be extremely um, useful whenever you're doing digital forensics, right? So to be clear about a few, you know, of these bullet points that I'm showing here, um, you know, you may be questioning, okay, so what is the relevance? You know, one of the things to highlight is that, you know, data in some cases can be encrypted, of course, right? So, um, and for the data to actually be encrypted, it actually needs to be unencrypted, right? So whenever you use it, this means that in some cases, data, you know, things like even passwords can be in an unencrypted state 
in RAM, right? So, so that's why, you know, in some cases, actually, you can even obtain, you know, information that, you know, in, in other ways will be encrypted, but in RAM will not, right? So, and the listing here, you know, of course, includes, you know, other things like running processes, uh, the passwords that I just mentioned right now, so any type of un unencrypted data, instant messages, um, executed console commands by administrator, right? So, you know, history of commands that perhaps was executed in the system and open ports. And one thing to highlight is that this is not only applicable for Windows-based uh, forensics, this is actually applicable for any type of operating systems, right? So for Linux, Mac OS X, uh, Android, uh, Apple iOS, uh, Cisco iOS, you know, infrastructure devices such as, you know, routers and switches and firewalls, uh, all these, you know, applies, right? So now memory can be managed in different ways, right? This is referred to as memory allocation, or memory management, right? Static memory allocation is when a program allocates memory at compile time, right? And also a dynamic memory allocation is when a program allocates memory at runtime. Uh, memory can be assigned to blocks representing portions of allocated memory dedicated to run a specific program. So a program will actually request a block of memory and then the memory manager will assign that block of memory to that specific program, and whenever that program you know completes whatever is designed to do, the allocated memory blocks are released and available for other processes and other programs to to actually use them. Right now that you have learned this concept, let's also learn what are stacks and heaps. A stack is the memory set aside as a scratch space for a threat of execution. Right, and also a heap is a memory set aside for dynamic allocation, meaning where you put data on the fly. Right, so. Unlike a stack, there isn't a lot of, you know, enforced patterns to the allocation and the allocations of blocks from the heap, right? So with heap, you can allocate a block at any time and free it at any time. A way to compare stacks and heaps is that stacks uh, are best when you know how much memory is actually needed, while actually heaps are better for whenever you don't know and you need, you know, this to be allocated in a lot more dynamic way, right? So you don't know how much data you will need at runtime, and if you need to allocate, you know, a lot of data, then memory allocation actually happens, you know, a different way. Another thing to highlight is that memory allocation happens in hardware, in the operating system, in programs, and also in applications, right? There are much deeper concepts for understanding how Windows allocate memory, but we will touch just a few of them. This level of detail is actually not required for the exam, but I want to provide you as much detail as possible so you can understand the basic concepts of forensics, right? So let's start with a concept called virtual alloc, right? So virtual alloc is a specialized allocation of the operating system, virtual memory system, meaning that it allocates straight into virtual memory while reserving blocks of memory, you know, to be allocated somewhere else, right? There's also heap alloc, right? So heap alloc allocates any size of memory that is requested, meaning it actually allocates on the default, right? Now, uh, again, you know, to highlight that heap is a general term used for any memory that is allocated dynamically and randomly, right? So in other words, uh, basically memory allocated out of order. Uh, the memory is actually typically allocated by the operating system with the application calling the specific API functions to do this allocation. Now that we have covered some of the basics of what makes up applications and how they use memory, let's actually take a look at another concept called the Windows Registry, right? So basically anything performed in Windows refers to or is recorded into the registry, right? So a formal definition for Windows Registry or Windows Registration will be a hierarchical database used to store information necessary to configure the system for one or more users, applications, and hardware devices, right? So some functions of the registry are to load device drivers, at, you know, also run the startup programs, set environmental, you know, variables, store settings and operating system parameters, right? So you can view the Windows registry by typing the command regedit, right? So here I'm showing the registry editor in Windows. The structure of the registry it's like a structured file system, right? So the left-hand folders start with the five hierarchical folders called hives, and they will begin with the term H key, uh, meaning, you know, to handle a key. 
Two of the hives are real locations, which are HK underscore users or HKU and HK local machine, right? Or HKLM. The remaining three are shortcuts to bridges within the HKU and HKLM hives. You know, each of these main hives are composed of keys. Um, these keys actually contain values and also sub keys, uh, sub values, right? So values are the name of the specific uh, attributes pertaining to the operation of the operating system and applications within a key. Now, a way to think about the Windows registry is comparing to an application containing folders, right? So inside of an application, inside of folders, you know, those actually hold files that are then executed. So inside the Windows registry, the hives hold specific values to be used by applications and by the operating system. Now here I'm actually showing the function of the five hives within the Windows registry, right? So start from the top, uh, HK underscore classes underscore root or HK CR. Uh, it includes information that makes sure that the correct program is actually open when it's executed. The HK current user contains configuration information um, that any user who is actually currently logged into the system, you know, will store, including the usage folders, you know, screen colors, control panel settings, and, you know, several other uh, configurations, right? So the reference location for a specific uh, user is key uh, HK underscore users, right? So now HK current uh, config stores uh, information about the system's current configuration, right? So we also have the HK local machine, like we mentioned before, and it actually contains machine hardware specific information that the operating system will actually run on, right? So uh, this includes a list of drivers mounted to the system and generic configurations of installed hardware and applications, right? Uh, and also we have HK uh, underscore users, which contain configuration information of all user profiles on the system. This includes and relates to application configurations and virtual settings as well. Another important concept to learn about Windows architecture is what are handles. And this list um, that I'm showing here uh, includes the key a handle concepts or the concepts of what are actually handles, right? So a handle is an abstract reference value to a specific resource. And they actually hide uh, the real memory address from the API user uh, while permitting the system to actually reorganize physical memory transparently to the program. A handle can not only identify value, but also associate access rights to the value, to the specific value. Now, a handle leak can occur if a handle is not released after being used. Now, another important concept to learn is what are services, right? So, Microsoft Windows services are run running executable applications that run in their own Windows session, right? So, the service control manager is the entity that, that enforces the rules and protocols for Windows services. Now, services are ideal for running things within a user security context, uh, also starting applications that should always be, you know, uh, run at runtime, you know, on, for specific users and long running functionality that doesn't interface with, you know, other users who are actually working on the same computer. Windows administrators can manage services using the services snap-in or the sc.exe, or the Windows PowerShell as well, right? So now the Windows event login service records events from many sources and stores them in a single collection known as the event log. Now, event logs typically maintain three event log types, uh, which are the applications, systems, and security log files. The event viewer can actually be open to view these you know, logs, by simply searching for the event viewer at the run tab. Uh, here I'm actually showing an example of viewing logs in the event viewer. Uh, the panel on the left shows the application system security log categories, while the panel on the right shows actually the actions, right? So a few things to highlight in here is that logs are records of events of what actually happened in your computer, right? So the most common place for Windows logs is the Windows event log, right? So now within the log types, are generally five event types, which are error, warning, information, success audit, and failure audit, right? So uh, also 
uh, there's a concept of a log parser, right? So a log parser is a versatile tool that provides universal query access to the text-based data in a specific log, right? So thus, in some cases, actually, logs can be not only cryptic, but they can be extensive. So a log parser, you know, can be a very versatile tool to actually provide that universal query access to the text-based data in your system.